Thank you very much, Sam. And what a, what a pleasure, what a delight to be here at the Festival of Preaching. It's my first visit, so thank you so much for asking me to share a few thoughts on what I've called poetic politics, preaching to the state we're in. It's essentially to see how political perhaps our sermons can be, should be, and how we might do that. I hosted a meeting recently at St James's Piccadilly, where I currently serve, with Westminster Council Electoral Services Officer. Did we have any accessible rooms for potentially becoming a polling station for local and national elections? Given the location of the church, which was in the south side of Piccadilly, we may be a good place, he said, to add to the number of accessible places in the city for citizens to exercise their right to vote. As it happens in that church, the accessible place is the church itself. And given Christopher Wren's vision of a light and wide, airy space, we do have room right by the pulpit and close to the sanctuary where we think we would set up polling booths for such an election. It may be then that in April next year, the pulpit oversees the casting of votes in Westminster. And I wondered at the time and wonder out loud with you now, whether that will make any difference. It's often said that political parties campaign in poetry, but govern in prose, a phrase attributed to the American politician and former governor of New York in the 1980s and 90s, Mario Cuomo. Political campaigns are conducted with rhetorical flourishes that don't then serve government so well when decisions about priorities are pressing and calculations about the allocation of resources must be made calmly accurately and without hype. The pulpit and the polling booth may be in close physical proximity in our church next year, but what should be the relationship between them in a democratic society? As a preacher, I've always been interested in this relationship. Taking my cue from Sam, who's just been saying that he never thought he'd get to the point where he said, I've been ordained 30 years. I'm going to tell you that I've been ordained 25 years. And at Theological College, I wrote a dissertation on the prime minister who defined much of the politics of my childhood, Margaret Thatcher, and her relationship with the Church of England in the 1980s. Not least because one of her most famous speeches delivered to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland in 1988 became known as the Sermon on the Mound. It was in Edinburgh. From the publication of the Faith in the City report in 1985 to the preaching of Robert Runcie at the Falkland Islands Memorial Service in 1981, which her husband wrote later made her livid, I came to the conclusion that this argument wasn't an argument between politics on the one hand and faith on the other. It was an argument within Christianity itself. There's much more I could say about that, but that's not the principal topic for today. I've never myself been a member of a political party, but have worked, as I guess, with, like many of you, with both Christian socialist movements and high church Tories, hosting Liberal Democrat policy team consultations with people in the asylum system, as we did last year. I was captivated by the description of the Church of England in the 1980s as guardian readers preaching to telegraph readers. <laughs> and the church itself had a bit of a moment in 2016 when it realized that most of its leadership were remain, but a lot of its flock voted to leave. But being political with a small p or avoiding too much party political polemics from the pulpit does not mean being apolitical or disinterested. A seminal moment, clearly, in the relationship between pulpit and politics in modern times was the famous radio broadcast given in 1933 by the Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who challenged the recently elected National Socialist Party leader just three days after their democratic election not on policy or actions yet, but actually on the grounds of idolatry. Referring to the Nazis' use of the term Führer to describe Adolf Hitler, his broadcast, Gott ist mein Führer, God is my leader, was cut short and he was taken off air. And so this has long given us perhaps our guiding principle in political preaching. 
which is not so much to do with how I as a preacher, as an individual, cast my vote. The key question, it seems to me, for preachers who want to remain engaged with the political realities their congregations live in is the question that arises from that broadcast by Bonhoeffer. How can I become as rooted in theological and spiritual reflection that I might be as alert as that in reading the signs of the times? So rooted was he in his theological understanding of God's place in the world that he was able to challenge that democratically elected party at a time when all other church leaders were saluting them. Speaking as a Church of England priest ministering in the 1990s and 2000s, I found myself preaching as part of the established church, of course, as an Anglican, and most particularly in my time as part of the chapter at St Paul's Cathedral. It was my duty, for example, to craft the church's public and national liturgical response to a number of political events. For example, the operations conducted by British military forces in Afghanistan, and most controversially, to the war in Iraq. Not simply a remembrance service, the government of the day and successive prime ministers were asked to sit in church under the dome of St Paul's and listen, not only to the litany of the names of the dead, but to join the note of penitence struck by the liturgy and the preaching from the then Archbishop of Canterbury. The service itself didn't make any reference to Thanksgiving, but was simply titled Iraq, 2003 to 2009. The established church was expressing not only pastoral concern for bereaved individuals, which is where it may have felt more comfortable, but invited the whole congregation, which, in, which included politicians from across the political spectrum, together to confess our failure to seek and establish that peace which God wills for all people. We were all invited to sing acknowledgement of our foolish ways, asking to be reclothed in our rightful minds. And Rowan Williams preached. He preached this. There were those among both policymakers and commentators who were able to talk about the conflict without really measuring the price. Perhaps we have learned something, if only that there is a time to keep silence, a time to let go of the satisfyingly overblown language that is so tempting for human beings when war is in the air. One of our most poetic archbishops calling out politicians on the rhetoric used to persuade in advance of the prose needed to govern. In reflecting on the relationship then between the pulpit and the polling booth, between the pulpit and politics itself, I'd like to address this relationship briefly as a way into those of us who are preachers choosing what to preach in the midst of what Bonhoeffer again memorably called the storm of events. What is preaching? It is rooted and grounded in the gospel, which is not in itself political. While I'm very sympathetic to the apocryphal St. Francis aphorism that we should preach the gospel at all times and use words when absolutely necessary, I'm hoping to speak today simply about preaching sermons. And sermons are irrigated by, only by, the gospel. The authority to preach sermons comes from the church as expressed in its processes of selection and training and crucially is only sustained by the consent of the will of the people. Is it your will, the congregation is asked, at every ordination or licensing, it's essentially the same question rehearsed every time a congregation settles down to hear a preacher lay or ordained preach a sermon. Is it your will? It's only by consent and ongoing consent that any of us have the authority to preach in the first place. And I've long been inspired in thinking about what happens in a pulpit by remembering that sailing boats often have pulpits too. The pulpit on a boat is the part right at the front 
It's a small platform to enable the person who's there to lean out further in order to drop the anchor more deeply. As a way of describing what I think I'm doing as I'm preaching, especially in the storm of events, it's often something like that. Leaning out as far as I can to plumb the depths, not just for me, but for everyone on the boat. In order that we are not unanchored, but aware that we are together trying to catch the wind of the spirit in our sails when we go again. We preach today in the UK within the laws of a state that is a constitutional monarchy, a relatively mature and sophisticated democracy in what sociologists call late capitalism. What is the gospel for the state we're in? And crucially within this particular political culture, for whom is our preaching good news? My first principle when thinking about this is not to forget to address the congregation as citizens in a democracy, apart from anything else. That is, as a political people. Psychologists help us to understand ourselves in three ways. There are some ways in which we're like every other human being on the planet. In fact, there are some ways in which we're like many other creatures. We need oxygen to live. We die without water. We dream, we hope, we lament. Sometimes we're afraid to die. We are like every other person on the planet. And with the help of a translator, we could find many experiences of life on earth in common. The first way is that we're like everyone else. But there are some ways in which I'm like some other people on the planet. My skin color, my language, my gender, the fact that I may be a vegetarian or speak Spanish or can't read or have a child or use a wheelchair or vote conservative. We're in groups, affinity groups, some based on ontological factors and others based in our choices or life experiences. And then thirdly, there are other ways in which I am unique. I am like no other person on the planet. My eye colour, my fingerprint, the unique mixture of life experiences, the losses and hopes with which I alone live. Universal, personal, and in the middle, political. Religion operates most comfortably in the first, the universal, and the last, the unique. It's in the middle section where politics happens and where the trouble often is. I sometimes try to challenge myself. Who am I addressing in a sermon? Am I pivoting always to the universal or the personal? If I am, then I'm ducking a key theme of the gospel, which is that our exercise of our own power and agency matters because our choices matter and the building of community and society matters, which is where politics operates. Sometimes I think that a sermon is best described in the lines T.S. Eliot wrote on a memorial to his wife, that we should preach private words addressed to you in public. Preachers should concern ourselves with intimate and profound questions of human life in the light of the gospel, nothing less than the salvation of our souls. But this is done not just personally and alone, but in public, in the light, accountably open to challenge. How we as preachers address our congregations as political people is important. The classic dividing line will be to urge people to vote without telling them who to vote for. The pulpit is a privileged place. Preachers are rarely interrupted, at least in the moment of preaching, so this privilege should be taken seriously. But this doesn't mean that risks shouldn't be taken or provocations made, of course. And the context of the preaching is vital here. 
In a long conversation with a congregation over years, that relationship is tested by provocative preaching, but can also be points of growth and development. I'm very fortunate at the moment to be ministering in a church that has an engaged congregation that most definitely lets preachers know what they think. A thoughtful response to a thoughtful sermon often comes by email or a preacher making themselves available after the service for discussion and challenge, or as it used to be some years ago at this particular church, a microphone passed around the congregation as soon as the sermon was finished, which of course invigorated some and infuriated others, and without exception, terrified preachers. All of these though, are ways for the sermon to become a collective endeavor, which is what I passionately believe it is. It's not one voice instructing other silent witnesses. Preaching through the Brexit referendum campaign was a challenge, knowing that in my case, most of the congregation were central London Remainers, but that I felt strongly that the fewer Brexiteers should be welcomed and heard too. Sermons that only address the universal or the personal can feel as if the preacher doesn't live a life that's recognisable to the congregation. But of course, a preacher who uses a pulpit as a personal platform for political views becomes not only tedious, but part of the wallpaper of noise that dulls the challenge of the gospel rather than amplifies it. Blandness, I want to suggest, works both ways. We can become, as preachers, a kind of ambient, apolitical muzak, like Christmas carols on a loop tape in a shopping centre, if all we do is talk about generalities. This is summed up by the quip I'm sure you've heard, that clergy are, generally speaking, generally speaking. <laughs> we can end up giving the impression that we simply indiscriminately bless all the activity in society, that there's nothing new under the sun and we're somehow or more damaging that God is somehow above it all. But I'm also suggesting that if we become too predictable in our politics as preachers, then that's equally bland and equally suffocating of the gospel's edge. I would rather be a preacher like Martha, who when Jesus asked for the tomb of Lazarus to be opened, said in front of the crowd without fear or favor that the body would be stinking. Sometimes it's important for us as disciples of Christ to name what is stinking, even in front of a murmuring crowd, even in the presence of God. So first, address the congregation as political people with agency and power. Second, address scripture as a political text. The story of scripture is the story of the people and how they found ways to organize themselves as itinerant groups, as settled societies, as people under occupation, as occupying forces, people at war, people developing agrarian practices, exercising power, casting lots, making choices and decisions about family, housing, supply chains, trading routes. The prophets' voices call kings and leaders to account as well as the people and the business of governing into this real world story comes the traveling preacher, Jesus of Nazareth, speaking as a member of a militarized society under occupation. His language is inherently political. The Basileia of which he constantly speaks, translated as kingdom or reign or commonwealth. Jesus deftly navigates the personal and political by insisting that this Basileia is close at hand, within you, beside you. If he did ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, it was in direct relation to the Roman imperial march which traditionally came into Jerusalem from the other direction. Horses, not donkeys. Generals, not messiahs. But wait, messiah is in itself an anointed royal figure with as much political meaning as spiritual. I suppose what I mean by poetic politics is the sort of politics I find in the gospel the inventive, creative, mini plays with vivid characters that Jesus writes in the parables reveal deep-seated inequalities, raise real-world questions, show different people trying to address them. 
the persistent, socially disadvantaged widow who changes the behaviour of the arrogant judge, the workers' wages paid to the latecomers overturning assumptions of what's fair. And if politics is about the exercise of power, both in campaigning and governing, in crafting policy responses to society's problems and choosing how to allocate resources, then sometimes Christian teaching can give the impression that the exercise of power in such a worldly way is in fact a negative thing, or at least a suspect thing, and that our own power is to be not exactly sidestepped, but at least played down. This, to me, is an indication that Christian preaching is presenting an exclusively middle-class interpretation as normative. Power, for those who don't have much, is really a very good thing in the right hands. And if politics is about the exercise of power, then the gospel is innately political in a transformative way. As Tim Gorringe writes in his Theology of Culture, Scripture is not of itself countercultural, but daily encounter with it makes us so. In the highly influential book, The Politics of Jesus, published first in 1972, John Howard Yoder set out a number of areas in New Testament scholarship that identified Jesus as a political figure, operating as a political figure. And these fundamental assumptions about Jesus are important in the preaching of the gospel, whether or not a sermon is explicitly political. One example I want to suggest of taking account of Jesus as a political figure could be Maundy Thursday's seminal action of Jesus to wash the feet of his disciples and call them friends. You'll be familiar with the story. As a paradigm for diaconal ministry and for discipleship as a whole, the washing of the feet is a vivid invitation to the disciples of Christ to serve. Following the example of Jesus, we are first to allow our own feet to be washed. His were washed by the unnamed woman in the house of Simon the Pharisee. Whether or not this is Mary of Bethany, this foot washing is intimately connected to the Maundy Thursday foot washing. This service offered to the disciples is, yes, a reinterpretation of the exercise of power and Jesus placing himself in the role of an employed servant, but it's not self-abasement, although it may be interpreted, as St. Paul later indicates, as self-emptying. Jesus is gloriously free throughout the events of Holy Week, with the heart of the action of God being to become willingly bound by human hubris, violence, and fear in the days before crucifixion. This is the action of a free person choosing to kneel. To preach this Maundy Thursday gospel just as that, without any reference to the power Jesus has to choose, is to harm the congregation members whose life experience is that they have had no choice but to kneel and serve and put the needs of others before their own. One short diversion to illustrate this, which is historic but interesting. During the First World War in Britain, governments, as they'd started to do in the 19th century, carried out nutrition surveys of the population. During the long years of the First World War and with the German development of submarines, food supplies were threatened. But in progressive surveys during the First World War, it was discovered that women's level of nutrition had improved from before the war. This was a curious finding until it was identified as having a cultural cause. Cultural norms of the time would dictate that women who did the majority of cooking would ensure that the men of the family and the children ate first and ate sufficiently. They served themselves last. Not only good hosting, as you might do today, but a persistent expectation that the woman's nutrition wasn't as important as the other members of the family. With men away at war, even while food supplies were under such threat, women ate better. To preach for a population that has either been encouraged by cultural norms or forced by societal expectations to be the one already kneeling 
the one already on the floor, the one already washing other people's feet, to preach a sermon which essentially states for everyone that this is the paradigm is essentially a socially conservative and unchallenging filleting of what is a powerful gospel picture of liberation. For someone who exercises power to be invited to learn to kneel and wash feet is one thing. For others, the path to salvation will be different. It will be to learn to stand first before choosing to kneel as a free person and only with the expectation that our own feet have been washed beforehand too. There is a danger in preaching the kenosis, self-emptying of the gospel, the upside-downness of the gospel in terms of the use of power. There's a danger in preaching this if there's no recognition of the wide-ranging experiences of power of the congregation to whom we're preaching. Preaching humility as Jesus is teaching without reference to the fact that enforced humility is the experience of many people is a weak demonstration of the gospel. Teaching people to stand before they choose to kneel is to preach redeemed humility. And this redemption is at the heart of a political gospel. To put it another way, preachers used to exercising their own agency, articulate, relatively powerful in the world, preachers preaching unredeemed humility is as if we preach that it's as if we preach uninterpreted that most unpalatable of verses in the New Testament, slaves obey your masters. A political gospel is one that saves us from such appalling mistakes as this. Which leads me to my final reflection about the politics of the gospel. An acknowledgement of the politics of the gospel and the political context from which we preach saves us from the fantasy we preachers often have about ourselves, which is that we can't help aligning ourselves with the ones we think Jesus seemed to like the best. I'm putting it a bit crudely, but without opening up a whole new area of reflection at this late stage, I think this last part has to do with the politics of sin. It depends on your church tradition, of course, but if we can, if we're not careful, fall into one of two extremes when thinking about this. We can be so focused on the sin each of us carries as a mark of our separation from God that we become permanent perpetrators, feeling often rather helpless to change and stuck in the perpetrator identity so strongly that we almost give up. Or on the other hand, and this is the besetting challenge in the so-called liberal churches like the one I serve at the moment, we can have been so hurt by all those personal sin arguments, often allied with identity, that we jettison all that together, talk much more about structural sin, and therefore cast ourselves not as permanent perpetrators, but as the opposite, permanent victims. Oddly, the permanent perpetrator and the permanent victim often re meet around the back of sermons about sin. And although some rhetoric isn't about not wanting to focus on personal sin, we can find ourselves, our churches, full of people who are often overwhelmed by guilt and helplessness because redemption, confidence and the right exercise of power can simply seem too frightening. This point is that when we're preaching on scripture with a political context in mind, without being trapped by it, it's important to try not to deceive ourselves, to try really hard not to deceive ourselves as to who's being addressed by the good news and where we fit in. A short illustration of this. In 2018, 30 of the congregation of St. James's went on a parish pilgrimage to Auschwitz, Berlin and Nuremberg. Partly, to be honest, as a response to the Brexit vote, we wanted to face together one of the defining stories of the continent of Europe and as Christians reflect and pray together. Many others from the congregation came to the preparation meetings and presentation at the end of the journey without coming on the pilgrimage itself as we tried to make it a whole church journey, physical, spiritual, historical, political. 
We took Dietrich Bonhoeffer as our spiritual guide, visited his house in Berlin from where he was arrested as part of the trip, and asked ourselves, as I suppose everyone asks themselves, what would I have done? What part would I have played in that horror? As a group mixed in terms of nationalities and identities, we spoke a lot in the preparation meetings about and many personal connections with the events themselves. Many connections were revealed through relatives, ethnicity, sexuality, nationality. We talked a lot about victims and perpetrators and the ordinariness of the infrastructure of industrialized killing the transport workers, administrative assistants and civil society, without whose cooperation the death camps couldn't have continued. But of course it was hard to face, that was the point. But one conversation really struck me with one of our pilgrims after the harrowing visit to Auschwitz-Birkenau itself. The group was of course left shaken and disturbed by what we'd seen. And most were trying to imagine, if they could, what it was like to be interned there. But one conversation with one pilgrim was instructive for me. I was trying to imagine, our pilgrim said, myself up in the watchtower, supervising, on shift, observing the slaughter of people day after day. How could I do that? And what did it take to put me there? and keep me there. Pilgrims often travel to holy places. This pilgrimage traveled to hell. But what I was moved by was the bravery of this pilgrim to make sure that they didn't avoid or dissemble the political culpability that they felt and that we'd talked about facing but found it hard to do in practice. Solidarity with the poorest in society, with what the Hebrew scriptures call the anawim, the orphan and the widow, for example, is a gospel imperative if you yourself are not amongst the poorest. The poorest in society find no surprises in Jesus's reclamation of power, challenge to authority, and energetic but elusive answers to political questions from Pilate, for example. But along with the philosopher Gillian Rose, who writes so compellingly, not least about the Holocaust, about how to handle culpability, it's much harder to inhabit what one of her interpreters calls the solidarity of the shaken. And it's that solidarity that must also be included in sermons about power. This solidarity is the most searing and truthful when politics is the arena for reflection. In my experience, sometimes we too quickly claim to be on the side of the poorest if we're not the poorest, without acknowledging the power we sometimes unaccountably wield on account of our own privilege, education or life experience. We too quickly pivot to the parts of us that are poor in spirit, to quote Matthew's version of Luke's beatitude. Yes, we must do this and preach from here, of course, but a spiritualized gospel message alone will be no use to anyone and is not faithful to a savior who in restoring the son of the widow of Nain, for example, not only brought to life that which was dead by touch, a message that has profound spiritual resonance and meaning, but challenged the economic destitution of widowhood and the social exclusion of bereavement for that woman. Recently, the Gospel of the day recounted Jesus' turning the tables over in the temple. I wondered what it would be like, not just to imagine ourselves rather righteously helping Jesus overturn the furniture of the money changers, whose rates were explo exploiting the poorest families, but to imagine us asking ourselves the question, what tables are you sitting at that Jesus would overturn if he could? At a discussion after the service, with some notable exceptions, most of us couldn't quite go there. So ingrained were we in thinking that our place was to join Jesus' challenge of other people and the system. And in this particular case, as largely beneficiaries of an unequal and uneven economic system, we were probably imagining ourselves in the wrong place. 
political preaching can be about time and perspective too. It can be said that living our lives according to the news cycle on which current politicians seem dependent is like trying to tell the time on a clock by looking at the second hand. It's accurate, of course, but it's exhausting and in the end won't help us to see what time it is. At its best, preaching, and political preaching at that, attempts to read the signs of the times by looking at the hour hand. No less accurate, no less contemporary, no less now, but moving at a different pace, related to the second hand, but not enslaved by its perpetual motion. Preaching is a whole body, whole life commitment, really. And understanding our own political identities as much as our spiritual ones is vital. Allowing scripture to be its political self, too. Thank you very much for your attention. I think there are some questions, probably. <laughs> Any tips for balancing addressing political situations without being party political and also avoiding being neutral or bland? <laughs> or just ask the questions. <laughs> I've just been quite rude about blandness in the lecture, so I, um, I understand the question. Um, I think maybe that last illustration, I don't just want to go quickly to a kind of metaphorical answer, but that last illustration, I, you know, we can't design policy from the pulpit, and it's also not our job. Very few of us are good at it. So it's not about saying what the government should do necessarily from the pulpit without reference to other contexts. I, I really genuinely try to see those questions as the second hand, but that our uh, object is to address the our hand. So I think that I would say, for example, I'm trying to think of a, if I can think of a, a current example. Um, well, a really, a really important one at the moment is immigration policy, something that the church I've I mean, at the moment, has been in, involved in and engaged in, and involved in campaigning as well. So with Alf Dubbs caning, uh, campaigning for unaccompanied child migrants to be allowed to come, and also encouraging, more than encouraging, um, the current government to fulfil their uh, obligation to resettle 20,000 Syrian refugees. Um, I think it's a whole church. It, it's in the context of the whole church. If you're doing that alongside the sermon, then the sermon takes its place. It's not a standalone um, event. It takes its place in the context of the congregation and what else you're doing. So if on a, if on a Monday I can be in a, uh, an event with Alf Dubbs talking about unaccompanied child migrants, my sermon on Sunday is not going to be disconnected from that but it matters that I was there on the Monday as well as there on the Sunday. So it doesn't mean to say that I can be bland in the pulpit on a Sunday, but from a pulpit, from a position of unchallenged, uh, from an unchallenged position, I would not presume to design immigration policy or to say what kind of borders the United Kingdom should have, or indeed whether board, national borders are right or not. There's huge philosophical questions there. But within the context of a whole church activity, if that's one of the things that your church is involved in, then I would, um, I would speak strongly about the common humanity and I would speak about that middle category that I said is quite tricky, that sometimes the group identities that we have can make it very difficult for us to have empathy for people from a different group. That seems to me a, an appropriate reflection for a sermon, um, but not designing immigration policy in 10 minutes 
after a story about the Good Samaritan, for example. <laughs> Have I answered the question, Dr. Weld? Um, I'm just going to ask it again. Uh, what might be an example of a political sermon or challenge rather than a universal or personal? Yeah. Do you, do you feel that's the same question? I it's a similar it, question. It's but a similar I, question, I think. I, I mean, what's an example of a political sermon rather than a universal um, or personal? Well, what, what, I've, what I've just said is to identify ourselves as political, as political people. And I think um, I, would, I would appeal to, uh, I would appeal to a congregation to take a position um, on an issue like, uh, I'll pick another one, on housing policy, for example, to not be afraid to open the question to the congregation. And also, I mean, you can express, I, I would express a view, um, but I wouldn't ever stray into party, party politics. I, that's a line for me, that's a discipline for me is not to stray into uh, p p critiquing a particular, a particular policy. I probably haven't answered that question either. Um, I'm curious uh, about the uh, s Sunday, the, uh, I think, 27th of June, 2016. Um, the Sunday after the Brexit vote. Um, did you have a migraine that Sunday and, and, and say I can't, um, can't make it? Do you know what? Or I wasn't preaching that Sunday. Oh. That's, it. <laughs> That's the delight of team ministry, isn't it? Um, but I think what I would have, what I would have done, and did, you know, in subsequent, it was a long, long had a long tail that uh, that result, didn't mm. it? I think I would have. I would certainly have acknowledged, because I know the congregation, I would acknowledge some of the uh, issues that I believed and heard were erupting out of the congregation after that vote, for sure. Um, but I, I, but as, I, as I mentioned a little in my, in my sermon, we were a largely Remain congregation, but it was very important to me that the Brexit argument was put in such a way, uh, I mean, I, I voted Remain, but I wanted to hear the best possible argument uh, against because I thought that it could be if, it, if those arguments are had in the light then it could be uh, in my view it could be defeated in the light but it had to be put in its best possible best possible way and not not um, subsumed so I would I would certainly have acknowledged that was, that would be more pastoral wouldn't it? I would acknowledge the where the congregation was um, and they would have known probably where I thought you know the, the referendum result should have gone um, but again I wouldn't have from the pulpit from the pulpit and this the, I, I do want to make that difference from the pulpit I wouldn't have fulminated against that result I might have done it in another context but not from the pulpit talking of fulminating um, the politics of the C of E can be out of sync with the political Jesus about which you spoke. The political... The political Jesus about which you spoke, about whom you spoke, I should say. Uh, any fulminating in order on the politics of the C of E? I don't know what the question, whether the questioner means the politics within the Church of England or the politics that the Church of England I imagine the questioner, I'm just inferring that the, that the questioner is referring to one or two of the issues that have been controversial within yeah. the Church of England, yeah. about which one might imagine St. James Piketty might, might have see. a view. Yes, sorry, yes. Um, sorry, I'll get it now. <laughs> I, um, to me, that is, that's, a very, that's a very slightly different issue, actually, oh, yeah. because because some of the basis on which the Church of England is having its political arguments are theological. So I have no difficulty in uh, mining the theological um, wisdom for making a case for a particular view from the pulpit. I don't have any problem with that if it's rooted in theology. It's, a bit, it's going back to my Bonhoeffer point that the, 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 the basis on which he challenged the government was idolatry and that to me is really interesting 
So if, it, if there's a theological point or a scriptural point that, um, that is obviously meaning that the challenge can be made, I would have no, I would have no hesitation in, in doing that. But if I was preaching something very, very kind of strongly polemical, and I'm not a particularly polemical preacher, but if I, I really, you know, obviously we vary our, vary our, um, our style from time to time. If I was preaching something polemical, I would explicitly say, and I'm, I'm here afterwards, come and talk, let's come and talk this out because, because it's an unchallenged and privileged slot. But you, it, that saves you from going into blandness. So I will really very straightforwardly, I mean, women's ministry is a really obvious thing. I've just preached hundreds of sermons on the fact that, that I'm allowed to preach a sermon. That's, a, you know, that's, a, that's really straightforward for me. But, but even there, I would say, you know, if you have a different view, of course. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think maybe one of the things I'm saying is that the political context is is much wider than that kind of 12 minute, 12 minute slot. And it matters how you are in the rest of life as to whether people will take you seriously in that 12 minute slot. You, you build credibility. It doesn't just come uh, by by clever illustrations or by uh, or by theological points being made. I don't want to say stop, yes. but that's my job. We're stopping. Right. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, <laughs> Lucy, you. and handling questions. Thank you very much.